Welcome to the magic of math, where we master math one video at a time. Today, our lesson is on representing linear functions with graphs. We're going to talk about discrete domains and continuous domains. The objective today is that you will graph linear functions using discrete and continuous data. The question I want you thinking about today as I go through the lesson is how can you determine if a data set is discrete or continuous? So that's what I want you able to answer by the end of this lesson. We are first going to talk about representing a linear function with a graph. In previous videos, we've talked about mapping diagrams and tables of values and ordered pairs and domain and range. And today we're going to put it all together and represent a linear function with a graph. First, we need to talk about a solution of a linear function in two variables. So a linear function has an input and an output, typically with an X and a Y. So X is my input, Y is my output. And when we have specific inputs that pair to a specific output, that gives us an ordered pair. So if I have the example of 2, 3, that is an ordered pair, and I have a linear function. This ordered pair is a solution of this function. It is a point on this line. If I put 2 as my input for x, my output will be 3. Let's prove that. So I replace 3 put 3 in for y and 2 in for x. Let's do the math. 1 half times 2 gives me 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. Th there it goes. It checks. So now we're going to take that one step further and talk about the graph of a linear function, which represents visually the set of solutions or ordered pairs that represent all the solutions of an equation. So a linear function, the graph of that is a line. By definition, a line is an infinite amount of points that together make the line. All those points that make the line, when we talk about them being on a coordinate plane, are all ordered pairs. Those ordered pairs are the set of solutions that make this function true. So if we look at the graph of our line, here we go, it has a y-intercept of 2. There's my y-intercept. This one has a slope of 1 half. Let's look at that. Rise 1, run 2. Rise 1, run 2. All of these points on this line that you can identify, an infinite amount of them, would be solutions or part of the solution set. So if I look at this, here's my ordered pair 2, 3, and there it is. It's on the line. 2, 3. Here's another one. Negative 2, 1. When x is negative 2, negative 2 times 1 half is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 2 is positive 1, and it checks. Here's my y-intercept. When I plug in 0 for x, I should get 2. When x is 0, 0 times 1 half is 0, plus 2 has an output of 2. And let's check one more. Here's an ordered pair, 4, 4. Half of 4 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. It checks. So you could do this for any value, any input for x. Our domain would be all real numbers, and our output, our range, would also be all real numbers. So you could pick any input that's a real number for x and find its output, and it will be a solution, and it'll be a point on this line. Now we're going to talk about graphing a linear function. So here's one for us to practice. First, I'm going to show you two different ways. The first way, we're going to make a table of values. I'm going to put pick inputs of negative 1, 0, and 1. I always ask my students to pick a negative value, 0, and 1. So if you pick three points to graph, then you will know if you've made a mathematical error and that you need to check your work because it won't form a line. So let's plug in negative 1 for x. Negative 2 multiplied by negative 1 is positive 2. Positive 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Now we're going to plug in 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0. Subtract 3 is negative 3. Plug in 1. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Minus 3 is negative 5. Now we're ready to graph our points. Negative 1, 1. 0, negative 3. And 1, negative 5. 
and we can connect those with a line, and that's our linear function. The second way you could do this is to identify that this is in slope-intercept form. So our y-intercept is negative 3, and there it is, crossing the y-axis at negative 3, and we have a slope of negative 2. So I could rise negative 2, go down negative 2, and run a positive 1, or I could rise positive 2 and run negative 1. But notice that my line is sloping down left to right, and there's my negative slope. So there you have it. So any point that you can identify on this line is a solution to this linear function. Now it's your turn. I would like you to graph this linear function both ways that I've shown you, using a table of inputs, find the outputs, and also check your work by graphing using slope-intercept form. Please pause the video now and come back to check your work when you're done. Welcome back. So I'm going to show you first using slope-intercept form. So my y-intercept is negative 1. Let's go ahead and plot that. It's going to cross the y-axis at negative 1. My slope is 2 thirds. So I'm going to rise 2 and run 3 and plot another point and connect the two points with my line. So this is the graph, and it represents all the points that are solutions to this linear function. Let's also look at a table of values. I picked negative 3, 0, and 3 for my inputs so that I would have integer outputs. If I didn't pick something to match up with my denominator to clear my denominator, then I would have had um, rational number values. So which is okay, but then it wouldn't be exact. It would be harder to graph. So 2 thirds times negative 3 is going to be negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. 2 thirds times 0 is 0 minus 1 is negative 1. When x is 3, 2 thirds times 3 is 2, and 2 minus 1 is 1. And we can graph those. Negative 3, negative 3, 0, negative 1, and 3, 1. Noticing that some of them are the same points you get when you graph it in slope-intercept form. Reminding you, these are only three of the possible solutions to this function. They're an infinite amount. The domain is all real numbers, and the range is all real numbers. Now let's talk about discrete versus continuous domains. Discrete domain is a set of x values or inputs that consists of only specific numbers in a set. So I'm going to talk about a real life example of buying movie tickets. So our domain or our inputs, our x values, is going to represent the number of tickets that we purchase. And we could have anywhere from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. We'll stop there. And then the cost is going to be also, I kept it easy, easy numbers for today. If I buy zero tickets, it's going to cost me zero dollars. One ticket, one dollar, two tickets, two dollars, and we can keep filling in our data. So cheap tickets today. Notice I do not have a line. I have what we call discrete sets of points. The reason is I cannot have a negative amount of tickets. You cannot buy negative one tickets to a movie, and you can't buy one and a half tickets or two and two thirds tickets, or 4.3 tickets. You can buy whole number tickets, one ticket, two ticket. But if you connected these data points with a line, it would imply that you could buy three and one third tickets, which is not realistic. So in this case, our domain is the set of numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If you wanted, you could put dot, dot, dot in here saying that, oh, you could buy more than six tickets. It's just not represented on this graph, and I haven't been giving a function rule for this. So I don't know if it's going to stop at six, and that is the most I can buy or not. So because I haven't been given a function rule, I'm going to close this set off at six. All right, now let's talk about continuous domain, which is a set of x values or inputs that consists of all the numbers in the set. So if we use a real-world example of rainfall, our x or our input, our domain, is going to represent the time and hours that it's been raining. And we're going to use, I've changed my intervals, so this will be 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2.5, 3. And our output is going to be the amount of rain in inches that falls. And I've got intervals of 1 half over here. So when I go to graph this data, 
here's my line. This is what we call continuous because time doesn't stand still. So time keeps elapsing and you can have one minute, one and a half minute. You can have one minute and 40 seconds and your rain is continuously falling. Okay, so this is not a rain fall that is happening um, without a constant rate of change. So the rain is steadily falling because it's a line, but it's continuous because time is continuous. So our domain here is a set of all real numbers. That's what this symbol stands for, all real numbers, such that x is greater than or equal to zero. Because when we start recording, before it starts raining, we have zero. That's our initial point. But after that, it has to be every real number greater than zero. Now it's your turn. I would like you to graph this function that is described in words. I want you to find the domain of the function and identify if it is a domain that is a discrete or a continuous. So the real world example I have for you is the number of calories burned y at a cross country meet after x minutes of running is represented by the linear function y equals 9x. I would like you to pause here, graph the function, find the domain, and tell me whether or not it is discrete or continuous. Go ahead and pause and come back when you're done. Welcome back. Let's do this together. So we have, I'm always going to title a real world graph. It's cross country. And Y is represented the calories that have burned. X, my domain, is representing the number of minutes that I've been running. I'm going to use intervals of 0, 10, 20, and 30. And calories burned, I'm going to do intervals of 45. So I collected some data ahead of time, and those are my intervals. If yours are different, that's okay. And then when I go ahead and do this, I found out that after five minutes, I had 45 calories burned. So if X is five minutes, five times nine, I've burned 45 calories. After 10 minutes, 90, and so on. And I've put a line here and identified that my domain is all real numbers, X greater than or equal to zero. If I run for zero minutes, I burn zero calories, so it can be equal to zero. And I'm identifying that this is a continuous set of data because time is continuous. Time has everything in between. I could do one and a half minutes or three and a third minute and count it that way. So it's all real numbers, continuous. Time is continuous. All right, here's another one for you. I want you to graph the function, find the domain of the function, and determine whether it is domain is discrete or continuous. So the number of cupcakes purchased, x, at $2.50 per cupcake can be represented by the equation y equals 250x. Go ahead and pause now, graph, determine your domain, and is it discrete or continuous? Come back and hit play when you're done. Welcome back. So your solution is, here we go, title our graph cupcakes. My Y value is going to be the cost, how much it cost me to buy X number of cupcakes. And here we go. I have zero and then one, two, three, four, five, six for my domain. And then I have my output in intervals of 250. Pretty self-explanatory because each cupcake is 250. So if I buy zero cupcakes, it's zero dollars, one cupcake, and so on and so forth. So there it is. Notice I do not have a line because my domain is going to be, I didn't even put zero in here, you could, but I started at one, doesn't make sense to buy zero cupcakes, but you could, some students do, some students don't, but I put dot, dot, dot in here because I have a function in here and it could keep on going. And this is discrete because I cannot buy half a cupcake. I don't think you could find a bakery to buy half of a cupcake. All right, and there you have it. That's how we represent linear functions with graphs and how you determine whether a domain is discrete or continuous. Thanks for joining me today at The Magic of Math, where we're going to master math one video at a time. Have a great day.